Twilight night, I very often take a pair of binoculars and use both eyes, but with a telescope you use only one eye. Well, why can't you have a binocular telescope? And now we have a large one, the LBT, Large Binocular Telescope, in Arizona. And Chris Lindor has been over there to have a look at it. This is Mount Graham, near the town of Safford in Arizona. At the top is an amazing telescope, and my guide for the journey up there is the man who built it, Dr. Jim Slagle. Can you see that uh, peak up there that has all those antennas? Yeah, just on the right there. Um, that actually goes back into the 1800s. Um, the name of the peak is called Heliograph Peak. Okay. And obviously heliograph was a form of communication that the army used, and they used it, um, of course, for Indian raids. And so Heliograph Peak has gone way, way back in history. We are not on the highest peak. We're on the third highest peak. And we actually did choose that for a reason. In the Native American beliefs, they believe uh, that the highest mountain on any mountain range is sacred. So when was um, the mountain first identified as somewhere astronomers would want to be? Started in the 80s, in the early 80s, with exploration of different mountain ranges. In fact, uh, they spent actually several years on this mountain, um, had a travel trailer uh, through, uh, lived through the summer and winter, looking for seeing, um, looking at the state of the sky. But it doesn't look that good today. This isn't your good this season. Is, this is called our monsoon season, and uh, we uh, actually officially started last week. So that's why we've got cloud over the mountain today. And that's what you brought with you um, when you drove down proper, from Phoenix. Proper yeah. London weather. Uh, it is proper London weather, <laughs> it is. Getting planning permission to build the telescope wasn't easy. The need to protect the Mount Graham Red Squirrel got the environmentalists worried and delayed the telescope for several years. But Jim's biggest headache was the road on the way to the summit. This actually was a road that was used uh, by wagons uh, in the history of uh, the people using this mountain. By the way, we've climbed 2,000 feet. That's a fairly fast climb, by the way. Sure. An astronomer measured, I won't say an astronomer, but I heard that it was an astronomer counted the number of turns <laughs> on this road. 523 turns. <laughs> And I mean, that's a lot of turns yeah. in a short period of time. So when you ask me, what's one of your problems? When you see it for yourself, you'll understand the magnitude of getting those pieces up this mountain. I mean, getting two eight meter mirrors up this road is scary and a scary enough thought. Just, that's why just I was you. your height and I weighed a lot <laughs> less and I didn't have blood pressure problems. So. In all, more than 600 tons of steel for the telescope, let alone the enclosure, had to be bought up the mountain. But the telescope's complete, and Jim and I have finally come to the end of our journey. So here we are at the Large Binocular Telescope. It's 16 stories tall, and the silver part is 12 stories tall. There's 1,450 tons of steel in the silver part that rotates, and of course this four stories in green here that you see is, is stationary building, but is central to the supplying the needs for the uh, astronomers and also during construction. At 10,500 feet above sea level, the large binocular telescope is in a stunning sight. But it's once you're inside the building that you truly appreciate what's being built here. As the telescope moved around, all we could hear was a faint hum. Its two giant 8.4 meter mirrors, each weighing 16 tons, sit firmly in its steel mount. Although the telescope's operational, it's yet to gain its instruments which will sit in the center gantry. These will use light from both telescopes, and only then will the LBT achieve its full resolution. Well, Chris, it's like I told you, 10 stories tall, and it weighs 850 tons, and it floats on oil. The scale of it is so unbelievable. I, I know, and everything here is controlled by computer, so that every piece of equipment that you see on this telescope, it's all computerized. We, we actually keep track of everything down in the control center, from temperature to weight, any kind of measurement that you might think of, we have total control just by the computerization of the telescope. So tell us a bit about the structure that we're, it's sitting in, because we've well, got this enclosure. Well, all of this was made in Milan, Italy. 
Um, I shouldn't say all of it now because we're refining it, the telescope, but the major parts of it were built in Milan. It took them over two and a half years to build the pieces. Uh, then they were shipped here to the United States, to Houston, where then we took it over road and brought it up here. We have a balancing system that we've just added to this. Um, you know how many uh, times you'd be uh, uh, observing uh, if they wanted to change an instrument, you might lose that night. Oh, it takes hours, hours it, and it, hours, because you need these big does. counterweights. Our, our way of doing things is a little bit different here. And we can actually balance the telescope within 30 minutes. So uh, we have the ability electronically, once more, with computers, of making this work. Uh, you are seeing the, the forerunner of the big telescopes, and we hope that all the, the changes we're introducing here are the things that we'll see improved upon in the future. So the telescope saw first light in October 2004. What's happened since then? Um, we've had our first illuminizing. Actually, we've had two illuminizing taking place here. That's the uh, coating for the That's mirrors. That's the coating for the mirrors. Um, somebody asked me one time, they said, well, do you take the mirrors down the road when you need to have them illuminized? We only wanted to bring those mirrors up here once. The real reason why Ohio State had, uh, did our illuminizing system, and so we clean the mirrors, we illuminize the mirrors, everything is done on site. Once the doors are open, the light comes in, hits the massive primary mirror, travels up to the secondary, and is reflected back down and off a third mirror, which sends the light out onto the observing platform. And that's where light from this mirror is combined with that of its twin on the other side of the telescope. And that's the beauty of the large binocular telescope. By combining light in this way, we end up with the resolution of a telescope that has a mirror more than 20 meters across. The next step for the LBT is to bring its adaptive optics online. That will eliminate much of the interference from the Earth's atmosphere, making its images even clearer. There is much work still to be done on the LBT, but you can be sure, when it's fully operational, its double vision will give us a view of the night sky unlike any other. Chris, um, I wish I'd been with you. Said I was, but at least we have now the director of the LBT, Professor Richard Green, who's come to join us. Richard, welcome to the sky at night. Thank you very much. First of all, um, why have you decided to build a binocular telescope? The goal was to achieve very sharp resolution on the sky. And there are two issues that you have to deal with to do that. One is the blur of the atmosphere. And this telescope compensates for that blur by changing the shape of its secondary mirror a thousand times a second. And it restores the shape of the light wave coming in. A thousand times a second. Yes, it has 672 <laughs> magnets glued on the back of a very thin sheet of glass. It's 90 centimeters in diameter and 1.6 millimeters thick. And, and this Ooh. glass continuously changes shape. Well, you've started your main programs. What exactly are your main programs going to be? When we combine the two beams, we'll actually take pictures that are 10 times sharper than the best pictures from Hubble. So to use that exquisite resolution, we'll, uh, we'll want to penetrate into the regions where new stars are being formed to learn about the disks in which planets might ultimately form and maybe even image a planet directly. We'll want to go into the bulges, the central spherical regions of nearby galaxies and count individual stars to try to do stellar archaeology and learn how those galaxies were assembled. And ultimately, we'll want to probe to farther distances and look into the hearts of quasars to see how, how to weigh the black hole, to see how hard it's pulling on stars and gas in its vicinity. And maybe, in the end, get out to the, the most distant redshifts in the visible universe and see how galaxies were assembled out of their smaller constituent parts. What new equipment will you use on this in the foreseeable future? We're phasing in the equipment piece by piece at the moment, and so the ultimate achievement will be the ones that actually combine the beams from the two sides. These instruments are enormous. The 
principal investigator of one of the beam combining instruments has a photo of himself and he's stretched out and he takes up about a quarter of the of his optical bench with all the optical elements required to capture the light from the two sides it's our job to hold the distance that the light travels after it hits the first mirror until it gets into his instrument, which is about 24 meters, and our job is to hold that accurate to about ten thousandths of a millimeter, then his instrument takes over and has to match up the crests and troughs of the light waves to a tenth of a tenth of a thousandth of a millimeter. So he has a little cryogenic slide trombone that moves up and down and matches the waves from the two sides to achieve the perfect focus. It's fair to say then that this is as accurate as any telescope ever made. That's the intention, that it is of huge dimension. It's 23 meters from the tip of one mirror to the tip of the other mirror, and we need precision to a tenth of a thousandth of a, of a millimeter when we, when we point, when we track, when we adjust the optics. Uh, one question I think I must ask you, if anyone wants to know this, uh, will the LBT actually show you a planet of another star? That's our big hope, along with our sister telescopes that combine light in a different way with the Keck telescopes and the Very Large Telescope. This one is uniquely positioned to um, get a wide field of view with this very sharp resolution that we complement those other telescopes. It's a great project and uh, so thank you so much for coming over and many congratulations. I think the LBT will certainly go down in history, it has a long, long way to go yet. Thank you so much. Thank you. News notes. Well, another body in the solar system had been classified as a dwarf planet. This is Marque Marque. It's of the same type as Pluto, a bit smaller than Pluto, and moves around the Sun beyond the path of Neptune. I've used a telescope of some size to see it. Now, why Marque Marque? It was discovered some years ago, soon after Easter, and then nicknamed Easter Bunny. Well, you can't that kind of name, so for a mythological name had to be found, and Marke Marke is a creation goddess of Easter Island, so the Easter connection is still there. So we have um, a new dwarf planet. <laughs> Welcome back to Chris, and of course Pete joining us now, and uh, interesting things happening on Jupiter. Yes, there are, Patrick. I mean, Jupiter is a very, very dynamic planet anyway. Um, it's not well placed for us in the UK at the moment. Too it's, low down. It's in Sagittarius and it is really low. But it's bright. If you see it, it's obvious. It's the bright thing on the near the horizon it is on the, after sunset and uh, for much of the evening. Absolutely. A number of people have been asking oh, yes. what it is, but and it, it is that bright thing, as you say, but it is terribly low. In this small telescope, we'll show you the, the belts and the main phases, including, of course, the great red spot. A whirling storm is persisted now for several centuries. And the Great Red Spot is actually the cornerstone, if you like, of, of the story of what's happening at the moment. Okay. But it has a companion, of course, which is Oval BA. And it's just south of the, the Great Red Spot, and that means it moves at a different speed. It moves at a different speed, and it meets up with the Great Red Spot every two or so years. But now there's even more interest because there is a third spot which is known as the Little Red Spot. It's red again. It has appeared unusually at the same latitude as the Great Red Spot, and as it's travelling at a different rate around that latitude to the Great Red Spot, something untoward is going to happen because they have to meet up. And in fact, that's just happened. That's just happened. It happened um, towards the back end of June, beginning of July. The Great Red Spot was actually having one of its encounters with Oval BA at that time. I like to think of it like putting clothes through the mangle. Basically, the Little Red Spot had to slip between those two spots. And there were very high winds there, don't forget. Incredibly high winds, and what happened was it basically got shredded and bits of it were seen going around inside the Great Red Spot, and then it got spat out the other side. But it may be about to have even more violent things happen to it, because it may be dropping back towards the that's, Red Spot that's itself. That's what I thought will happen, yeah. It will drop back and then it will go through another interaction again. Let's look at the moon as seen from um, Deep Impact. Deep Impact studied Comet Temple 1. Part of the probe smashed into the comet in a spectacular explosion, but the flyby spacecraft took images of that and is now on its way to another comet. 
planet, but it's also looking back at Earth. And here's the moon <laughs> transiting oh, yes. in front of That's the Earth. That's amazing. It's great, isn't it? it? Is. As seen, it's false colour, yeah. but still, as seen from deep in bed, it comes back round again. It's like a little sadly, bit. that actually looks like a simulation to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a long way away. It's about 30 million miles from Earth, I think, yes. is the number. So the point of doing this is, uh, A, it's fun and it looks great. But secondly, this is Deep Impact's mission now. While it's on its way to its next cometary target, it's studying stars to look for the brief dips in brightness that are associated with extrasolar planets passing in front of the star. The transit method. Exactly. You see these tiny blips and you know something's gone they in the are, They are tiny blips. That Absolutely. But this is a large blip. So that you can think of this as a nearby version of the same <laughs> method. So. Were, were the colours, by the way, correct? Uh, no, they're, they're not real colours in that image. They're, um, this is a mixture of infrared and then blue and green. Oh, right. Okay. So it, it's slightly redder than you'd expect with, with real colour. There is a real coloured version yes. um, a, around, but this one shows the details of the moon much more clearly. And here it comes. You can see it just crossing Africa there. The thing about the Earth, when you see it like this, which is remarkable, is to see that little highlight on there where the sun mm -hmm. is shining yes. off the oceans and the, and the clouds. Yeah, there. it glints every so it's often amazing, when it catches it? something. Now, let's come now right back near home. Um, things happening... Uh, in our outer atmosphere. Pete, noctilucent clouds. Well, there have been some absolutely fantastic displays of noctilucent clouds. I should explain what a noctilucent cloud is, first of all. These are uh, very high clouds. They occupy a very thin layer of the atmosphere, about 85 kilometres up. They're about seven times higher than the highest cirrus that you would normally see. They're supposed to be quite rare, actually, um, but you can't see them unless um, the lighting conditions are right. And this occurs when the sun is below the horizon. So it, the, there is no light coming to illuminate the normal clouds, but the light can get up to the really high levels. And when this occurs and you've got the right twilight conditions, these clouds appear to shine in the night sky. In fact, that's where the word noctilucent comes from, night shining. And they have a sort of steely blue coloration to them. They have a lot of structure um, and they're very, very distinctive. Don't forget it's Perseid time. The Perseid meteor shower occurs every year, maximum early morning of August the 12th. Oh. Oh. It really is worth um, going for it in the early morning hours because that's when you're, oh, you're likely to get the best view and, and the most likely probability. And something that we, are, we should see well that is the partial eclipse of the moon on August the 16th. That's right. 80% and maximum about 10.10 summer time. It should be quite an interesting um, partial, actually, because 80% is, it? is a big amount of um, the moon to be eclipsed. Do you think we're going to see colour with that? I think we certainly will. You know quite know with eclipses of the moon, because everything depends upon the conditions in the Earth's upper atmosphere. With all the light reaching the eclipsed moon has got to go through our atmosphere, so it depends what's up there. I think reddish, pinkish, but light. A dark anyway. reddy brown, I think. Dark greyish. OK, well, we'll see who's <laughs> right. But that's the joy of a lunar eclipse, is waiting to see quite what colour you're going to end up with. And, of course, there was uh, the eclipse of the sun. That was on August the 1st, only about 20% partial here. I hope you saw it, because it was um, totally in other parts of the world. And next month we have reports of what that total eclipse was really like. And believe me, it'll be fascinating. Pete, Chris, thank you. Thank you. Next month, we're going far beyond the solar system. We're going to look at Galaxy Zoo. And if you want to know what that is, join us next month. Until then, good night. <laughs>